Life or death treks have a special place in Australian history. The ill-fated journeys of Burke and Wills and Leichhardt are enshrined in national mythology. But less well known is the remarkable tale of two German aviators who survived for more than a month in the outback before being rescued. An Australian pilot has now recreated their feat, braving crocodiles, heat and hunger. Erin Park follows his journey and a warning, her report contains images of Indigenous people who've died. It's a prospect that would terrify anyone. Alone, on a raft, off one of the most remote coastlines on the continent. But not quite alone. Just in case you're wondering whether there's any big salties around, check out that big log. He is a monster. For Mike Atkinson, this is the fulfilment of a dream decades in the making recreating what historians call one of the great Australian survival stories. I wouldn't normally get that close to the cliffs. Ooh, looks like we're going to miss it. This is just absolutely spectacular. I feel that this is one of the greatest untold stories of, of humanity. I think it's one of the real epics. The term seaplane is used to indicate marine aircraft. It was an era when the world was entranced by the idea of taking to the skies. In 1932, Germans Hans Bertram and Adolf Klausmann were part of a team attempting to circumnavigate the world in a seaplane. They took some bananas, some cigarettes, a few bits and pieces. They even had their bathrobes on board for their hotel in Darwin, I expect, and they took off. Mac McCarthy knows the story well. He says it was on the leg between Indonesia and Darwin that things went horribly wrong. They took off, they ran into a terrible storm and were blown, unbeknownst to themselves, were blown west, well away from Darwin. The men mistakenly thought they had landed at Melville Island, not far from Darwin but they were in fact 370 kilometres west, on a beach on the remote and barely populated North Kimberley coast. After a failed attempt to use the last of their fuel to fly to Darwin, the pair set off on foot, soon suffering sunburn, dehydration and bites from swarms of mosquitoes. On the third day, they put all their clothes in a bag on their head to go across a creek and they notice these floating logs coming at them and realise they're crocodiles and they take off and lose the lot on the banks and then they walk all the way back, four days back to the aircraft. And there they are seriously in trouble. This was the ordeal that RAAF pilot Mike Atkinson decided to recreate as a tribute to Bertram and Klausman, filming every step of the way. So I've done my best to only take with me the same items that the aviators had. I've searched around op shops and things like that and come up with a fairly good representation of what they had. He's starting at the same remote beach where the aviators found themselves 85 years earlier. Unlike them, he's got emergency communication equipment as backup but he's spending weeks living off the land to see how he'd cope in similar conditions. So just pick a non-poisonous plant and just lick the water off. After more than a week loss, the aviators had hit on a new plan, ripping off the seaplane floats to make a makeshift raft, now part of the collection at the WA Museum. They make a canoe out of it and start paddling, and they paddle off to sea. Amazingly, the state ship Kulinda passes within a mile of them, but doesn't see them. Sun might have been in the eyes of the watch, who knows. And then they come ashore again, and their, their spirits are really going down. They're getting dehydrated, they're malnourished, and they crawl into a cave and prepare to die. And we're talking now 10, 20 days into this whole thing. Mike didn't have a plane to use for a raft, so he prepared a replica before he set off. I honestly don't believe it. 
even though I've really committed to this thing, I've set the sail, we're moving forward, and even more importantly, I'm going slightly upwind to round that little point there to get out of the bay. Just got around this last point. The aviator's actually got washed up trying to exit the bay, I'm guessing on those rocks there. Mike's handmade raft is holding up better. But almost a century after the aviators struggled along this coast, it's become harder to avoid other humans. You're in the middle of absolute nowhere, and you're around the corner, and there's boats everywhere. And they get dropped off by these motherships that cruise around the coast. Sticking to the aviator's journey, Mike comes ashore to face a gruelling 65 kilometre walk. Time to take a look around. He's got into a rhythm. By day, trying to avoid heat stroke and sunburn, finding the occasional outdoor shower. By night, trying to camp a safe distance from the big tides and crocodiles. Food proves a constant challenge. Hey! Oh! <gasps> oh! Then I'm just loading up the boat. And I had the line out still, and I've got this beautiful little rat. After two weeks of living off bush fruits and scraps of meat, his condition is starting to deteriorate. Yeah, I feel tired. Stomach was rumbling loudly all night. After 38 days waiting for rescue, the aviators were also fading fast. Mike has found the rock shelter where the pair spent those last desperate few days. Wow, this is it. <laughs> I actually just got a bit of a shiver. This is definitely the place. It um, fits the description in the books, in uh, museum research I've done, photographs. This is where they sat for a long time thinking they were probably going to die. This was actually the first place that he saw one of the local rescuers for the first time. Three Balangara men who had come to the spot to fish saw the dying aviators. The story of what happened next has been passed down the generations. So I get, uh, feed them some fish? Yeah. Till they got strong enough, and then that's when the the colonel took up from there, came here to the mission, and let father sense know that uh, there's a couple of uh, white people over there. The mission raised the alarm, and a policeman was sent out to bring the men home. Constable Gordon Marshall arrived to find the two men starving and traumatized. Realising they were in no shape to walk out, he sent off two of the three Balangara men, Andamari and Jalga, on a gruelling 230 kilometre run to Wyndham to fetch further help. This is, I think, one of the greatest parts of this whole story, apart from, you know, the wonderful looking after the people by the Aboriginal folk, by, you know, the epic of the whole thing, the flight in itself. Andamari and Jalga. Now, these two men are asked by, by the constable to run to the mission to say, bring the boat. Whereas the earlier group took six days, they took two days to run to the mission. The aviators never would have been found without Aboriginal people. And it's amazing that during the search, the authorities assumed that Aboriginal people must have already murdered the aviators. So they had chained up nine of them in the search party and yet they continued to help search and found them. During the ordeal, mechanic Adolf Klausman suffered a mental breakdown from which he never recovered. After being escorted back to Wyndham, Hans Bertram returned to Germany a hero and went on to become a successful filmmaker. Mike Atkinson had plenty of time to reflect on their ordeal during his own solitary journey. I've got the utmost respect for them. My journey has been a different journey to theirs, but I've only scratched the surface of what theirs would have been like. 
So I've got the utmost respect for the aviators and I've also got the utmost respect for the Aboriginal people who rescued them. When they first saw them, they said, oh, this, they're human as, as like us. So they treat, treat them the same. Shall I lift it? Yep. Yeah. For Mac McCarthy, it's a tale of survival and kindness that deserves a place in the national narrative. To me, one of the greatest pieces in this book by Hans Bertram, which is a must read, is the quote that he has in there. We were found by the natives of Australia, naked black men. When I tell you how those Samaritans of the wilds tended and cared for us, you will understand that I wish to bear witness to the greatest and noblest virtue of the human soul, charity.